I'm Dr. Raker with. Go. Odd Men for DCs is a is an organization for day, for doctors nationwide for chiropractors and nurse practitioners. What we do is we hold your hand through the process of getting certifications, getting training, equipment, and also the hassle factor of equipment and uh, how to service equipment or getting the service equipment service and the uh, the database that we have of forms, paperwork, it's all been created for you. And all you do is copy paste it off of our forms right onto your letterhead. We're also there, Raker and I are there 24 seven. You can call us anytime if you get in an exam room with a, with a driver who's had a, a recent heart attack and they've had open heart surgery and you're not sure how to, if you can certify them, you're gonna call us on the phone and we're available for cons uh, for con consulting purposes. It's been so, a benefit to me. I've called several times or texted, yeah. and uh, records say just call me. And so one of the things that you know I I love about Ahmed for DCs is the uh, Google Drive access that I have to so many of the different files that we use with with y'all. Um, everything from marketing to equipment to purchases to training. Um, it's pretty much all inclusive, so it's been a huge benefit for, for our office, and it's uh, made a significant difference in the total available income that we're generating as a result of our connections. And we teach you the, the language and the lingo and the, uh, the way to talk to businesses. We teach you how to do marketing to businesses. How do you approach them? What do you say? We have scripts that, that are tried and true that we've worked on for 20 years on how to, to close that deal, to close that sale. Uh, you know, it's not enough to make a phone call or just get on the email list. You've gotta go out there and shake their hand and we teach you how to do this without fear of rejection or without fear of loss. You're gonna have the confidence and we build you the confidence by doing some practice sessions with you. We also have videos of doctors that we've videoed going through the process of how to do the cold calling techniques. And believe me, no one else is doing this. Concentra's not doing this, Nova's not doing this. Other occupational doctors are not doing this. But believe me, the, the, uh, the business managers, the HR managers, the safety personnel of the companies, even the owners of the companies, they appreciate you coming out there caring enough to share with them uh, how to save the money and how to save them time. Absolutely, and as an individual practitioner, one of the benefits of OpMed for DCs is you give us the, the basic outline and uh, samples of brochures and letters and you know obviously the scripts, but the, the core materials that you need to go out and carry with you in addition to the knowledge of how to present that with the tools that we have right. are also given as well. So that's really an awesome opportunity for any doctor that wants to join. And two, Doc, I think one of the best benefits of being a member of Ocmed for DCs is you have a network of family. You have a, a group of doctors in the United States that are a few months ahead of you, maybe a year ahead of you, maybe two years ahead of you. And during our lunch and learn that we have every week, every week on Tuesday from 1 to 2 p.m., we have, we all get together. And there will be 50, 60, 80, 100 doctors throughout the United States on a Zoom call. And we produce a, a, a one hour show called Hot Med for DC's Lunch and Learn. And we have special guests come on there. We have other doctors that, that will talk about, hey, how do I get business? What is, uh, or, or this is what I do to get business. This is how I advertise. And so this family that we have is uh, all about helping each other. Right. And I think it's the best thing that we provide for our doctors. I agree. That it's a big asset. I rarely miss the Tuesday uh, course. I'm on Central Time, so it's from 1 to 2 p.m. for, for me. Um, and so I, you know, I'm there pretty much every it, week. But if you do miss it, see, we record every show, and it goes into the Lunch and Learn archives. And so if you say, well, I'm working between 1 and 2 on Tuesday. I can't watch the show. I can't be there. You can ask, access it through our database as a member, and we have over three years of shows. Because it's in a database, you can type in the subject you want to, to, to cover, 
type in the word marketing and it'll pull up every show where we talked about marketing or it'll pull up every show where we talk about how to do a DOT physical or how to do pulmonary function or audiometric testing or blood surveillance. And so that's the great thing about our Google database is that you can find things very quickly and go right to the, the video and stream it straight from our uh, uh, Google database onto your laptop or computer and watch the show there. Yeah, that's been a big help. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the hand-holding that I've had and there's no reason to reinvent the wheel that they have successful actions and tools, everything from the promotion and marketing to the scripting to the know-how to the equipment that's necessary to be utilized. So, I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. You need to join. You need to join today. One other thing, y'all. One of the things that we have, a lot of people don't realize, we paid over $15,000 for a lawyer to write a, a, an employee contract. You see, when you have your business, you need standard operating procedures. And each employee in, uh, in the business, from the front desk, to the medical assistant, to the associate doctor, to the chiropractor, to the nurse practitioner, to the supervising physician, they all need a contract and they need to have direction. So we've built all that for you. And why is that important? Because you have non-disclosure agreements, non-compete agreements inside there that has been thoroughly looked at by a lawyer. Those forms are available for Ocmed members as well. That's really exciting. You know, here I've been in practice uh, close to 39 years now. And over the last 39 years, I found that there's some real common problems at pretty much every chiropractic office has. The first one is enough new patients to sustain the growth and development of your business. The second one is procedures and how to take care of the people when they come in. The third one has to do with administrative uh, handling the, the process of, um, of, you know, like you just said about the, the contracts that's necessary to be able to bring people in. And, and, and the last one is just hiring and firing. You know, those are some things, and uh, I don't know that there's a lot of information on the hiring and firing, but if you have the right administrative tools, it, it works out no problem. So, yeah. y'all got pretty we, much all the bases covered. We have created a 75-page uh, policies and procedures for each part of this business in occupational medicine. And so, when you train that employee, uh, you need to train them right. They need to have a policy that they sign saying, this is what you've agreed to do. You're not allowed to step outside that policy. You're not allowed to do your own thing. You have to follow these procedures and policy as they're written. Because as you know, doctor, we're required to follow the law. Right. And so when that happens, those people that work under us have to follow the law as well. This brings me into a, a, another section I like to talk about is that uh, Many of our doctors have a fear of liability to do this business. And they're like, well, I'm afraid that I don't have the skills or training to do this work. Or can I do it under my license, under my scope of practice? Well, we're telling you, you can in all but New York, Michigan, and Washington, you can do DOT physicals, drug alcohol testing, and other procedures, occupational health related services. And all we really do is we're doing evaluations and we're doing reporting. So when doctor does a DOT physical, he does the physical exam according to the FMCSA guidelines and his training and his experience. And then he makes a determination, a medical determination on uh, the length of time for that driver to be certified. And then he certifies the doctors. And then he notifies the company they work for or the federal government under the FMCSA notification. So really all we do is evaluation services and reporting. You're not performing any treatment at all. Now, if they have a chiropractic disorder or a problem that need to be, needs to be addressed, you can address that with them and say, by the way, this is something we need to get fixed. And that would be on a different office visit. They would need to schedule for a new patient exam, right. you see. So a typical DOT exam in our office runs pretty smoothly because we've been taught by OpMed for DCs how to process through everything. 
We actually use something called 3B Exam, which is one of your affiliates. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, the, the, the drivers send a link, they fill out their part before they arrive. They love that because it saves a lot of time from them having to sit in the office and fill out a bunch of forms. We usually bring them back immediately. We give them a cup, they pee in it. We do a urine test. We immediately check their vision. We go ahead and get their blood pressure, height, and weight. And then typically after that, they, they go into a room. We also, we, we look at part of a, we do a postural assessment. We have digital postures exam, which helps me kind of tie together everything that I do as a chiropractor. But it also gives me a little bit more health information that might ascertain weaknesses that they may have, limitations of movement or function that I can ask them about. And so, you know, we go through the process of the exam, we, we look in the eyes, we look in the ears, we listen to the heart, we test reflexes, maybe look for hernia. Um, and basically, it's just a simple exam that we do that we might do normally, and we've been trained to do on any number of people. And then once that, the guidelines for FMCSA is pretty straight on, you know, if their blood pressure is elevated, you give them a one, you know, one year physical pass if, they, if it's below a, they're, they're, they have a peak range that they can't go beyond. And if their vision is okay and they are under 20, 40 on their vision and their hearing is sufficient. So you're just following guidelines. Just following the guidelines. And right. the guidelines are pretty straight. And all you got to do is just know what they are and practice practice what, what we've been taught. So there, there are going to be times when you can't remember the guidelines. And so what do you do? You call me or yeah. Dr. Yeah. Riker, and we're great, we're right there able to help you and give you that information. And they, they've yeah. changed a couple of things every once in a while. Like, for example, used to, if you were on uh, insulin, you couldn't get a pass. Now they allow it. Used to, if you had uh, monocular vision, you couldn't get a pass, or you had some other kind of limitations. But FMCSA is, is interested in allowing drivers that want to drive, that are capable of driving, to be able to drive, even if they may have certain limitations that in the past so as a doctor you're given discretion we are we give so you're giving discretion. some just wider discretion than what it was in the past right this is, brings me into another uh question doctor from a driver's point of view let's talk about the people we see as drivers now the biggest complaint that i get from drivers every year is they're making me wait it is 11.57. Okay. Right then. So we've got about another hour. Let's start, <coughs> let's, let's start that. Let's start over. Well, that's okay. Go ahead. Three, two, one. Synchronize. Go ahead. Doctor, uh, thanks for being with me today. And as you know, I work with a lot of drivers, a lot of companies out there. And uh, the biggest complaint that I get from companies and drivers, individual drivers, independent drivers, is... The exam costs too much, and they're making me wait. The third thing is, they don't do a very good exam. I want to talk about what you do here in your office, and what's important to you for the drivers. Well, the, the real key for a driver is to, for me to ascertain whether that they're going to be able to safely drive a vehicle over the road. Um, that's that's sort of the FMCSA guidelines. They want to make sure there's safety involved. I mean, that's the purpose of the exam. So when I do an exam, that's my predominant interest is, you know, determining whether or not they can actually do the job safely. Um, a couple of things that we see that can create problems are um, many times, unfortunately, drivers are busy. They're eating on the road. They're on the go. They don't, you know, they're they're in the road on the on the truck for you know, many, many hours at a time, and hardly any of them have a primary care doctor. And so a lot of times they have these underlying health issues they may not even be aware of. So we try to look at and investigate as much as we can and give them good health advice. One of the more common problems that we see is a lot of drivers are dehydrated either from drinking too many um, energy drinks or too much coffee and not enough water. When that happens, we see a lot of protein spilling over into the urine, and it's a simple solution in most cases just to tell them to drink more water. Uh, many times also, when, when protein comes through the urine, um, it can, the, the kidneys are basically just a fence, and it allows the, you're supposed to keep certain things on the inside of the fence, 
Now you're you're from Texas, so you know you've seen a lot of fences over the years. Right. And if there's a bunch of cows in the road and we're driving down the road and we, we come up on some cows, what I can tell you for sure is that that cow obviously got out of the fence. Right. But do we know why or how? Not always. But if they're associated with a, a high specific gravity, we know their urine is too concentrated, and a simple solution is just drink more water. Right. That's one of the things. The other thing is because of the driver's uh, propensity to not eating correctly, many of them are carrying more weight on their frame, and they can develop something called metabolic syndrome. Their, their blood sugar becomes out of balance. They start developing, uh, uh, you know, have problems, and we, we find that in a in a urinalysis when they have high glucose in their urine. And if that's the case, it's sort of a red flag from a health standpoint. It's probably one of the most serious problems that a driver could have because it can cause all kinds of issues relative to even the possibility of passing out while you're driving. So we look at that, and when I normally see that, I, I want to check and I ask them, do they know what their A1C level is? So that's another little ancillary test that we've added to be able to offer that service to drivers to check their A1C Instead of them having to leave and go to their medical doctor, wait in the medical office, and have to pay another fee for another lab test and another office visit to another doctor, I can just charge them a simple fee for an A1C and it makes it more convenient for the driver. So one of the things I'm real concerned about is trying to make it convenient for the drivers. Right. We don't have the drivers wait. They're not in, in our office with a bunch of sick people and we want to try to do what we can to make it convenient. My objective is to get them back on the road driving safely and yeah. I don't want to necessarily fail somebody but I but I have to follow the guidelines and I try to make it really clear as to what if there's a if there's an issue I try to explain it and I say do you have you have you understand why we're making this determination right and then they say you know I, I want to I want them to tell say yes it's, you know a lot of companies come to me and they ask is your doctor driver friendly what does that really mean well it's like you're conscientious of the fact that this is, a, this is a person and that they have a job and a livelihood and they have bills to pay and they have a job to do and, you know, it's just basically being treated the way you'd want to be treated. Right. And, you know... I think the biggest fear is they're going to lose their source of income. And that anxiety builds and builds and builds and they're like dreading, they're dreading this appointment with their doctor. Okay, they have to do it once a year, once every two years, and they actually lose sleep over it, they get sick with their stomach, and that actually raises their anxiety level up. And, and unfortunately, and, their blood right. pressure. And what I have seen with a lot of these drivers is when they build a level of trust with the doctor, that he's there to help them, one, become healthier, and two, we want, to keep you, we want you to keep your job. I'm not here to see that you fail. If that's not what they get at these large urgent, these large corporate uh, chains uh, that are nationwide, they don't, they don't really care about them. They said, well, we don't really give a crap whether you're driving or not. Right. And they don't really care how long the employee has to wait in the waiting room and they don't care about the cost that's set by corporate and they, and so, you know, and they, they really definitely don't care about the health of the individual. Um, one of the things, the comments that we get a lot is that all your folks here are really, really nice. And that, that's what we are after. That's what being right. driver friendly is, is just being nice to people. And so I think all of the Ahmed for DCs are going to be in that same category right. is that we are care providers. We provide care and it's the reason we provide care is because we care. We care for the drivers and we care to make sure that they're able to be, get what they need when they come in. Now, our, you know, we've seen this with a lot of the larger corporate chains in America with urgent care centers that they're like, well, the, we're not, this is, a, this is a hard and fast rule. If you're overweight, you automatically have to have sleep study. That's another fear our drivers have out there is that I don't want to have to have a sleep study when I don't, I don't have sleep apnea. What do you do when someone comes in and uh, that, that's a, one of their fears? Well, I mean, that, that is sometimes an issue with drivers. Um, you know, there's a, there's a common s score that we look at as part of the exam. They fill out the questions. So if they say they're over a certain BMI, 
they're above 50, they're a smoker, they're on blood pressure medicine. Um, and then, you know, we ask them, do you snore when you sleep? And, you know, that it kind of puts them up into a moderate risk category with those all those things that I just mentioned. We also look at the opening of the inside of their mouth. There's a, a name for that test. Man potty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we look at, you know, I, I don't try to confuse the drivers with my technical right. knowledge, but right. I, just, I just want to get a picture of the inside of your mouth. I want to show you this. And now here's the here's the guidelines. Where do you match up? And if they if they fall below below a certain opening space because of their weight and it closes up their mouth, and I try to explain it to the driver like this: like, look, um, nobody wants to get a sleep study, but I have never had a driver come back that's had a sleep study that was disappointed that they they it, they, it makes such a difference in their life. Right. And I explain it to them like this. You know how important the fuel air ratio is for the efficient running of your vehicle. Your body's the same way. You need enough oxygen to combine with your fuel, fuel to met metabolize and to make your body operate the way it's supposed to. And if you're getting insufficient oxygen, you're putting more stress on your heart. You're putting more stress on your lungs. You're creating a lot of a lot of different problems that can be avoided. Most people who end up with a sleep study that may or may not require a CPAP, but if they ever do require a CPAP, they never want to go without it because right. they feel so much better. So much better. You know, you know, I'm a doctor, and I before I started doing consulting, I had my own practice. We were in DOT physicals, and I had this one driver come back in, and he said, he said, doctor, I want to thank you for saving my marriage. And I said, what, what are you talking about? And he said, you insisted that I get a sleep study and you got me set up on a CPAP machine and that saved my marriage. My wife is now sleeping with me again. She was sleeping on the other side of the house. So were the kids. Even the dog was wanting to sleep outside because I snored so much. But it has done a tremendous job with my marriage and I never thought of it, but it's true. There are so many ways that, uh, uh, getting treated for sleep apnea with a CPAP machine can change your life. It really is. So I don't want the driver <coughs> to be fearful uh, if they can get testing cheap, cheaper. Now I'll tell you right now, if we sent you to a, uh, a pulmonary specialist or a sleep study specialist, you're talking four or $5,000 for a sleep study. Y'all can offer, and I know that our other doctors can offer this test now as a home study. Yeah. Our, our, as a home sleep study. We, we do offer a home study for our drivers. I ask them, would you rather go in the hospital and get this test done or would you want to do it at home? Right. And I would say 90% would prefer to do it at home. Right. And so they get their test done at home and we are able to get the data from a sleep specialist who reads the, the report and then we're able to report back to the driver whether they have sleep apnea or not. And uh, then the doctor will authorize a specific level of treatment, whether it's a CPAP or BiPAP uh, device to to help treat their sleep apnea, correct? It's correct. Now there yeah. are also mouth guards that can open up the uh, air pathways and so there's a, a third option to okay. have to work with a local dentist that, that he has to have a sleep study to document that but you can go to some dentist and they can make these mouth guards. Okay, mouth pieces. Yeah. Okay, and awesome. So there's an alternative to that if they're not, uh, if it's not too complicated. Right. So those are all options. The sleep study, home sleep study that we use, they work with the uh, employee, the, the driver to get a sleep, a CPAP. Now, one, one last thing about uh, that the drivers need to know about sleep studies and uh, about CPAP usage. Once you're been documented that you need a CPAP. It's a, it's a FMCSA requirement that you are utilizing the CPAP that they've been recommended. Yeah. So we require our drivers to bring in or send us a, um, a report of utilization. And the requirement is you have to have 70% of the time. Most of them are 95 or higher, right. but they, we have to have that as part of the documentation to get you your four year long pass. Right. Well, you know, FMCSA and federal law says that if a driver has been diagnosed with a disorder called obstructive sleep apnea, and he's 
given a prescription for a CPAP machine, he is required, and they see a CPAP machine as a form of therapy, as you know, and so he is required to use that CPAP for a number of hours, a minimum of four hours a night. Now, most drivers say, I sleep with it every night, eight hours a night. And that's so ideal, right? But once they're diagnosed, they're gonna to have to prove to the certified medical examiner that they've been in compliance with the law, which is ongoing usage, right? Now that doesn't mean 30 days before they see the CME doctor, I'll start using it and get a, give them a 30 day uh, piece of paper or, or data sheet and say, see, I've been doing it for 30 days, okay? And another thing is the doctors now, or the forms now can tell if that CPAP machine, if that mask is hung up on the bedpost or not, or if you're actually using it. And so we can determine whether you're in compliance or not with the federal law on your use of your CPAP machine. Most drivers are appreciative of the oh, CPAP. Oh yeah, they are. Because how much better it makes them feel. It's just, uh, you need to make sure if you're going in for a DOT exam, um, that you and you have been prescribed a CPAP that you bring the report in. They're all computerized now. now so. Right. What do you do if a driver says, uh, I just can't get it to fit right. I don't like the way it fits. I don't, it, it, it bothers me at night. And, and so what can be done uh, if their, their mask is not fitting right? What do you recommend? Well, if they have their device, we could have them bring it back and we could look at it. Maybe they're not wearing it properly. Sometimes some simple adjustments. Again, it goes back right. to driver-friendly uh, approaches to dealing with things. It's kind of like, what can we do to help you be able to pass your exam and to live your life in a healthier way? I'm, I'm remembering too, another thing that there's a service that's offered through some of your members uh, and our affiliation with you that they offer um, some ongoing wellness testing and consulting work right. with the drivers, and they do they do that um, they do that uh, by phone or online. Is that correct? That's true. That's correct. Now, I, uh, uh, consulting services is very critical, but I will say from my personal experience, I have a CPAP, and I struggle with using one. It takes weeks and weeks to really get used to using it. And there are like 12 different styles of masks now. Back in the old days, you had one choice. Well, now they have nasal cannulases, they have a nose mask, they have a full face mask, they have a half mask, they have a mask that comes down in front, they have a mask that goes across the top, out the sides. So there's no excuse for you not finding the right fit for a mask. Yeah. But, it, but you've got to have somebody there to help you with that and find that right fit for you. Well, the, the company that we use for the, uh, the home sleep studies, they work extensively with and communicate directly with the drivers right. um, and help them find the right device for them. So we, we're fortunate we've got uh, somebody that can participate with that. All I do is write the script and we send it off to the guy and then he reaches out, contacts them, make sure they got the right shipping address, comes in a box, they get it, they get it, they, they strap it on, there's about three pieces to it. You get a finger measuring oxygen, a little computer that straps around your chest, and they nasal, wear that all night. And they wear that all night, a nasal cannula. And then he, he comes in and, and talks to you when you got it set up. So he, he documents that it's you on the machine right. as part of the requirement for the test. And so he'll, he'll, he'll kind of video uh, chat with you. And like through a Zoom call? Well, just, yeah. Or Facebook, over the phone. Facebook Face, Live FaceTime. or something. FaceTime, FaceTime. yeah. So, yeah, so he'll, he'll make sure you're doing it correctly or make some little corrections on it if you need it. You sleep all night, and if you slept four hours, then um, you basically box it back up and put it back to them, and then within a few days, you got a report back. Now, a lot of questions drivers have is, and I see this from independent drivers, is what's this thing about consortium? And, do, and I own my own truck, and my wife drives the truck. Do I still need to be in a consortium? My answer to them is, Yes, and the, the reason is is because FMCSA no longer allows an individual driver su to submit their personal results for their drug or alcohol testing. It has so to does this to mean I'm going to have to get tested every quarter because I'm an individual driver? You know, if, if you, I'm only one driver, 
I would be the only one getting testing, right? Well, if you're in a larger consortium group, like we offer in our office a, a consortium group, and we actually have different consortiums depending on the company and the size of the company. And then basically what happens is you've got to have somebody to administer the, the group. You have a, a census list of the employees, and FMCSA requires that 50% of the drivers have a drug screening annually and 25% have an alcohol breath anal analyzing test. And so your name is put into the random. To a large pool. To a larger pool. So that means you may go two or three years and never have to have a test. It possibly could mean that you have to have two in a year. It just depends on the random draw. On the draw. Yeah. And so it's basically randomized and it, and it pulls your name up out of a hat, so to speak, out of that pool of, of, of group. And then uh, that works out pretty well. Now, there are um, national companies. Now, I, I asked one driver one time, who's an independent driver, and uh, I said, do you belong to a consortium? He said, yes, I do. I said, well, how much do they charge you, if you don't mind me asking? He said, I believe it's about $1,800 a year. And I'm like, whoa. Wow. Oh, my. And I said, you know, we can, we can do that for, you know, about three $400 <coughs> uh, yeah. or less, depending on, the, you know, the number of drivers. And a lot of our companies, the larger companies, if we have a, 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 a contract with them, we offer it to them at a discounted rate in, on top of that. So, you know, we're, we're willing to bend over backwards to help any company right. with any, any, any need. You know, if they have a need, then the, between what we have affiliated with Ahmed for DCs, we can supply that need. Excellent. If you're a company, if you're a company and you have a, you have a need for DOT exams, a need for breath alcohol testing, a need for drug testing, uh, a need for a consortium. Um, on top of that, there's other services, like if your employees are required to wear a, a, a mask, a respirator. Uh, we do the OSHA fit test questionnaire, the mm -hmm. pulmonary function testing, and the fit test for the mask. Right. Now, I haven't gotten into the qual qualitative one, but I do the, I, I'm not sure which one's which. I did do the one with the smoke. That is qualitative. I do the qualitative. So there's a quantitative, some some masks, they, some companies. They use contracts. a device. They use a machine yeah. to do it. Now, I don't. I don't do that one yet. You can do manual, qualitative, or machine, which is quantitative. Yeah. You know, some companies are requesting from our doctors to to do reasonable suspicion training, and reasonable suspicion training is a great way for a doctor to build a relationship with a company. And so this is a one or two hour uh, uh, slideshow that you would do a PowerPoint with. And do you do that for companies as well? You know, I have not yet. I'm, I've got a guy that's been really great working with me, helping me with some of my um, internet and um, outreach things, YouTube and stuff like that. I'm going to have him begin to reach out to companies and talk to them and maybe even offer some of those types of services. You know, Ahmed for DCs has that training already. Yeah. All he has to do is, is use that same script. And this is authorized by the National Transportation Safety Board and by FMCSA, which meets the requirements for reasonable suspicion, suspicion training for all owners, managers, and supervisors that work in companies. That's a critical element of your business. If you don't have that, and OSHA comes out and does an inspection on your company, you are going to get a little ticket for that. You're going to get reprimanded. If you some, don't have a document signed by someone that's done reasonable suspicion training. Yep, yeah, and there's there are some additional types of training and requirements that some of our employers have asked for relative to um, getting a certification for their work comp. And if they do that, right, they do that, then they get a discounted rate for their work comp insurance as well. This brings me into a, another question, and this is a one of the biggest items on the list for employers and companies uh, are recordables. Recordables, that is the, the, the buzzword of the century, is man, my rates are, work comp rates are killing me because of my recordables. What does that really mean? Well, basically, OSHA requires uh, an injury that meets certain criteria to be recorded in an OSHA uh, I think it's a 100 or 300, 300 OSHA, 300 OSHA form 300, uh -huh. and so that's a requirement for them to do that. So what one of the benefits of working with a chiropractor is, let's say an employee is cut. Now I can do first aid in my office, and if I come in and apply a steri strip and maybe put a little bacitrate ointment and wrap that wound, right. 
then that's first aid, which is non-recordable. Yeah, and so you're able to do a minor amount of uh, uh, triage, as we say, right. to help that employee. Now, I do know that if that same employee went to the emergency room, what's going to happen then? They're going to end up getting a shot and a um, stitches. Probably stitches. And uh, a prescription, typically. Yeah. Probably uh, antibiotics, right? And probably pain medicine, correct? And they may say, "Well, you know what? Let's take you off work for a week." Right. That's an automatic red flag for a recordable, right there. If Absolutely. They're, if they're not taken off of work, yeah. Whereas I know in your office, what you do is you work with the employers and you try to find a way <coughs> to get them back at work and keep them working. Absolutely. And, and so that they can heal in, in a timely manner and uh, take care of those little issues, which can reduce the recordables considerably. Yeah, um, I'll give you some other examples. We see a lot of, um, we've seen a lot of burns in the past, and you know, you, you'll come in and they might have moderate level second degree burns with blisters. I can do a little first aid, kind of trim that up, put some, some of the uh, gauze that, that provides a, a healing for them wrap it for them and check them back maybe in a week, make sure it's healing correctly. Again, first aid, not recordable. Right. Um, the cuts, objects in the eye, m most of the strains and sprains, the benefit of utilizing a chiropractor is that most all chiropractors really by law uh, don't wish to prescribe drugs. And so you're gonna be able to have an employee come, get some basic first aid, get some help, Get some, you know, we can do everything, including x-rays if necessary to check for broken bones. Now, if it's a broken bone and it can be splinted in the first aid, that's different from a, a fracture that's got a bone protruding through the skin. That's one that you probably <coughs> wouldn't bring. To, that's, that's an injury that probably will not be brought to a chiropractic office. Uh, but you could make that decision if someone comes in, you're going to say, you know what, this person needs to be in the emergency room. Right. And so you're able to make that call. We get calls like that from companies all the time. And they'll call me on the phone and say, hey doc, we had one of our employees fall and we're not sure whether we should take him to the emergency room or bring him to you. And the first thing I asked him, I said, well, where did he fall from? They said, well, he was just stepping up on the curb and he fell over. Or no, he fell off of a three-story building. Well, here's your sign, you know, if he fell off a three-story building, he probably needs to be in an emergency room. If he tripped and stumbled and fell, bring him in here. Let me look at him. Let me make a determination whether he can return to work and we can bandage him and do first aid. And so that has worked real well with our, uh, our companies to save the money uh, and reduce those. <coughs> and so they're able to work out a relationship with the doctor financially to provide that level of service and we call it sub-workers comp before it becomes a workers comp claim. And they really appreciate that. Yeah, one of the keys is uh, we found that working with a chiropractor, um, you can also do types of ergonomic preventative training, how to lift classes and some other things. You know, if you have a, if your OSHA 300 log shows that you've got a particular area that has a lot of injuries, and maybe maybe we need to do some pre-employment testing. Like back strains. Yeah, make sure you're hiring the right person. We can do some national back fitness testing that can basically quantify the predominant likelihood of that person getting hurt. Um, muscles out of balance are more predisposed to injury. And so we, I'm, I'm actually part of a national safety certified uh, back power uh, plus program where we do a program called back power it's a it's a simple back test that measures muscle core muscle balance right and you know there's a there's a really great strategy that you can implement for a company that has a lot of back strains you can test all of the employees and see where they grade out and those that grade out in a poor score that might be more likely to hurt themselves can be given the, the tools and the stretches and the exercises to do at the job site be, to prevent an injury, right? And and if they if they're currently hurt, then there's simple things that we can do to work with them from a therapy standpoint to get them lined up and balanced that will allow them to get back to work quickly. And if they're safe, they have the tools. If something happens, 
one of the, one of the biggest concerns that I've heard from some of the companies I've worked with is is uh, Billy Bob's been out fishing all weekend and he comes to work on Monday and we think that he did something lifting his boat up on the trailer and he's right. now reporting a job injury. How do we know that this happened on the job? Well, um, if you are doing little group stretches in the beginning as a, as a could part of the work, many companies are doing that now. They'll gather to together, they'll like, have like a little uh, powwow or a little safety talk and they go through a few little brief stretches and if you see Billy Bob can't bend over and touch his toes like you want him to, maybe you need to ask him, when did you hurt right. your back? And this is before he even starts his shifts. So there's a lot of different strategies that we, that we see that can be really helpful um, to work with employees. We, uh, one other thing that I found too, working with companies, is that uh, if a company has a fair number of injuries and that they find that a large proportion of those employees are hiring an attorney right off the bat, there's a problem usually with the supervisors not, not treating the employee with the employee feels as fairly. And so sometimes we have to implement supervisor training as part of the educational process of how do you deal. Most employees that get hurt on the job, they're just concerned about the lack of income. And they, want, they really want to get back to work by and large. They're not trying to pull the wool over somebody's eyes. They want to get back to, to work. Right. And so we try to evaluate them and assist them and work with the company to get them back. We found that if you keep an employee out of work, the longer they're out of work, the less likely they are to go back to work. But if you communicate with them properly and you treat them fairly, they're less likely to go out and hire an attorney as well. Right. So that's important as well. You know, too, this leads me to the next thing. And I believe in an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Absolutely. In that you're doing the pre-employment physicals, uh, what we call post-offer pre-employment physicals for employers helps to save them problems down the road. There are some employees that you just don't want to hire. There are some employees that don't physically qualify to do to meet the physical demand levels of the employer. And so what we want to teach our doctors in Ock Med for DCs in our network, you already know this already, but that employee has to meet the physical demand levels of what that employer needs in a job. For example, that employer couldn't hire me to, to build scaffolds or to climb a ladder. Doc, I'm sorry, but you're just not fit for that job. And so by having these pre-employment physicals, uh, you're able to, to prevent these recordables from happening in the first place. You know, and everybody wins when that happens. Absolutely. One of the requirements, you know, they, had, they passed that law, I think it was in, um, I want to say, 80, when I can't remember exactly, 84 or something like that. It might have been after that. Um, the, employee, the American Disabilities Act was passed. And so and it almost stopped all pre-employment exams for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And basically, an employer can't do the exam. And, and, and the reason is, is because if you deny a person a job based on an actual or perceived disability, you're in violation of federal law. Right. And so, but you can use a third party like an Ahmed for DC's qualified doctor to do pre-employment exams because they're collecting the information and it's part of the tools. And if we find somebody that doesn't qualify for the job. And for example, if they've had three back surgeries and right. they've broken their ankles twice, is that the right person to do the kind of work that that employer needs to have done? And well, you can address that. If they're a material, material handler and they're bending over and pulling objects out of a, out of a crate, Probably not. They're going to re-aggravate right. themselves. So we we have to make that assertion of, of whether they're qualified to do the job. Now, one of the things that we found is important is that if you're basing it on some test, the test has to be uh, directly correlated to the essential functions of that job. Many jobs could be reasonable, have reasonable accommodations. But in many instances, those are not available. Sometimes the essential function of the job is you got to bend over and get this thing over and 
you know, you, is certain aspects of the job that's physical demand. For, for example, if someone had, is blind in one eye, would, would they qualify to drive a forklift yeah. if they're in a warehouse and pulling things off of them and they're having other forklift drivers around them? And see, we had this happen. We had an employer that asked that we were doing their drug and alcohol testing for them. And I said, why don't you let us do your pre employment physicals? Because I can guarantee you there are probably some people that you shouldn't be hiring. We're doing a lot of your, you're getting a lot of new hires coming in here and your company's growing. And he said, uh, okay, we'll start doing that. And they started sending them in and sure enough, we got the guy with the blind eye, and he said, I'm a forklift driver. And we said, you don't qualify to drive a forklift with one eye, because it's just too dangerous when you have no field of vision on your left side of your body. And, uh, and so that saved them a potential dangerous work environment. Or someone's lost their hearing, and uh, they, you know, if they don't have uh, 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 hearing aids, well, that could be a problem on a job site where they're having to operate a crane or they're having to, to, to move dangerous equipment around when someone is backing up a truck and they can't hear them coming with, with the beep, beep, beep thing, you know. So there's a lot of reasons employers need to have that pre employment physical to help save them from someone getting hurt. And it needs to be done by a third party group outside. Right. So if they decide to do that, then they'll be liable. That's right and maybe uh, potential lawsuits from discrimination or whatever. But if you let us do that, the doctors, then we can make a decision based on evidence-based medicine, based on your skills and training, that this person doesn't need a physical demand level without that issue of liability. That's right. Okay. What were you saying? It's 1230. Yeah, let's, we yeah, 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 yeah,